Have you ever wondered how video monitoring systems are architected? Well, today you're in luck as we explore how Arculus, a video monitoring IoT company, created their architecture in the cloud. I've invited Ben, their cloud and security architect, who will share more with us today. Hey, Ben, welcome to the show. How are you and what do you do at Arculus? Hi, thank you, Priyanka. My name is Ben. I am the cloud and security architect, although Arculus is still a startup vibe. Um, we, we operate under like kind of more of a collaborative product team. Um, which allows me to wear multiple hats. I not only get to kind of work on architecture and security, but also get to work on machine learning, look after multiple teams, uh, and, and also get to experience more hands-on with our uh, more enterprise customers. Wow, that is all sorts of different things from ML to security. That's, that's a huge spectrum that you work with. So we know at a very high level how video and IoT monitoring works, but I'm curious what Arculus exactly does. Arculus takes all of the information from uh, a multitude of devices at the edge. And, and what we do is we have a small appliance at the edge that kind of captures all that information and then processes it and then pushes it all the way through into the cloud, specifically the Google Cloud. OK, so uh, all right, that, that makes sense to me. We have some devices. They are sending data to the cloud. And then there is some processing happening with that data. How is it actually architected? And I guess before we even get to how is it actually architected, what is video security as a service? And then we can dive into the architecture. Sure. Video security as a service um, is kind of like a, a SaaS-based product that's obviously storing video. Typically, um, our traditional competitors are, are VMSs, which are video management solutions. What they do is they collect all this video information, make it easy for people to find incidences or, or people within video across uh, hundreds of cameras. OK, Ben, so what are the challenges in building a system like this? And I'm actually really curious about why you chose Google Cloud for this. Sure. Uh, we, we chose Google Cloud primarily because of speed. We, we, we evaluated multiple cloud providers at the time um, because we wanted more of that on-premise feel. Uh, Google won out. Um, the other key, key aspects of this as well was access to your product managers and engineers directly. That really helped us as a startup to be able to get 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 more information faster and help train our engineers up quicker as well. All right, so time to get into the architecture and the details. And you've given an indication that obviously there's customer sites where you have the IoT devices that are sending the data into Google Cloud, and then there's processing happening on there. But I'm curious about how the data makes it from those IoT devices into the cloud, and then what happens afterwards. Sure. So each of our customer sites ultimately have a small appliance at the edge that uh, allows us to buffer the information before it makes its way to the cloud. As we all know, internet's super reliable. Um, so we are hardware agnostic. Uh, we can deploy on any bare metal. Um, we can also deploy inside of VMware. Uh, and then we have Kubernetes at the edge that allows us to deploy multiple containers and different systems as needed and ultimately shift compute where it should be. Then also we have our last mile connectivity. Um, that, that's really powerful um, because that's primarily the reason why we chose Google. Um, we're able to provide almost near near zero latency. Is ultimately, it's just that last mile piece. Um, so we're able to actually deliver video sub seconds to anyone anywhere in the world. Awesome. So. We got into we got into Google Cloud at this point. Before the data gets into the services running on GKE, um, you must have some load balancing that's happening, right? Yeah, so we actually have over 90 microservices in GKE today. Um, so, so, so we really utilize GKE, it's super awesome. Um, but before, obviously, we hit the, the GKE instance, we do use our load balancers. Uh, we use both L7 load balancers. We do utilize some of the more interesting features that you have inside of the, the HTTP, HTTPS load balancing and endpoint connections. Uh, but we also use a lot of L4, uh, for instance, with WebRTC. And then finally, we have IoT Core as well. Um, with IoT Core, um, we actually use that for some of our metadata. The metadata flows up through. Uh, from some of those services at the edge. Um, and that feeds into PubSub, um, which then also feeds into BigQuery. We didn't talk much about the databases that you're using. I assume you have pretty much the spread of both relational and non-relational in this use case. Uh, but can you talk more about the databases? Sure, yeah. We utilize all kinds of databases, uh, some hyper-specific, some not so specific. Um, 
probably one of our biggest uses today is obviously using uh, we actually use Cloud SQL uh, again with that that lighter weight, not not needing to have to manage those instances. Um, we use both Postgres and a bit of MySQL, primarily Postgres. Um, we also use, um, like you mentioned, a couple of other more exotic databases. Um, we actually use uh, graph databases, including a Rango. Um, we actually have an interesting uh, NIST-based permission graph model, uh, uh, which makes uh, permissions way better for horizontally scaling. Um, traditional methods don't work so well. Uh, single store, uh, we actually use that for a high rate of ingestion. Uh, we've tested that to more than 400,000 inserts per second. Um, the Postgres is mostly used for our device configuration. We have tens of thousands of devices globally. All of our configuration is stored in our Cloud SQL Postgres units. Uh, and then BigQuery we actually use for slow storage. Um, so, so as we connect and have all these different pieces of information coming in through metadata, we slow store that inside a BigQuery uh, and obviously um, really powerful to be able to run jobs across uh, large data sets. Wow, yeah, that is a lot. And like I said, like I imagine it, it is a spread of all sorts of databases. Um, the, the, I, I want to go back a little bit and dive into the video files themselves. I, I think you mentioned, briefly touched on the fact that these video files are, are chunked and then you, you put them into, into cloud storage. So um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Because yes, the files are stored in cloud storage, but the way you do them sounds really unique. So I want to know more about that. Sure. So video um, is mostly stored today inside of the uh, custom container format that we ultimately use. Under the hood is ultimately H.264, which is a very common video format. Uh, within video, you have keyframes. Uh, and those keyframes are chunked up. Uh, depending on the camera, they may be at one second, two seconds, four seconds. Um, and that's how we ultimately split that data up. Um, so we could be pushing millions of files per month per device, depending on how that's created. Um, we actually recently built a new way of aggregating that information so that we didn't have to uh, spend so much money on our put requests. <laughs> and we use that in combination with PubSub. Um, all these messages fly through PubSub and allow us to get those into the information into the databases to allow quicker access. OK, OK. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Now, deployment, um, what's your CI CD like? How do you deploy these microservices? I heard 90 services, so I'm really curious how the deployment works. Sure, yeah. Um, we use a multitude of different services. Deployment itself is typically through Spinnaker. Um, but our build process is actually through the uh, cloud build platform. Um, we also heavily uh, or heavy users of the uh, the container services that you have as well for container management and deployment. So how do you actually monitor these systems? Because there is a lot happening here. Sure, yeah. We use uh, cloud operations uh, primarily as it's native to uh, the Google platform. That's a huge win for us. Um, we also use New Relic. Uh, we also use Dynatrace for some services. Uh, and then um, we have our own stack with Grafana and Prometheus as well, depending on the services that are being monitored. When it comes to dealing with a platform like this, security obviously is extremely important because you're pretty much doing video um, and dealing with sensitive data. So specifically, um, monitoring any open ports also it could be a problem. So how do you make sure your architecture and components are secure? Sure. Um, so, so that's really, really interesting. So, so we have all these, uh, we, we use, again, multiple products to do that. Uh, we have our third party penetration test companies that we have, we, 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 we contract with to make sure that uh, we have that, that covered from an external, true external perspective. Internally, we do use the, utilize the API scanners. We also use the uh, Cloud Security Command Center that you have as well inside of the product uh, that does provide some pretty good uh, basic CIS stuff, which really helps us understand which which ports are open and whether something is configured. Um, we do have some other special sources as well, um, which I unfortunately cannot talk about. Thanks, Ben. I learned a lot with that with that entire architecture diagram. But what do future technical enhancements to this architecture look like? And um, what is the next generation of video analysis system? I'm, I'm pretty sure you're imagining it. Um, so I want to know more about that. Sure. Um, from an architectural standpoint and from more of a like kind of operation standpoint, I think the next things for us are actually implementing Istio, um, maybe Jaeger as well, getting more distributed tracing in. 
Um, from a machine learning perspective, um, we, we're kind of focusing on our machine learning operations pipelines, uh, allowing our users to potentially be able to retrain on their own data and, and getting much more granular in that kind of aspect. And, and then um, I, I think that's kind of the two key parts. Thank you so much, Ben, for spending some time with me today and sharing about the video monitoring systems. Thank you, Priyanka. It's been awesome. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot today. How IoT devices send data, how video monitoring is done, and how all the data is used for business insights and machine learning. My mind is absolutely blown. But the cool part is it all begins with a plan, and there's always a really cool architecture to uncover. I've included some resources for you to check out in the description below, and I'll see you next time.